Well, it is a joy to welcome Leslie Wales. Some of you will know her, not know her, but when we were praying about and thinking about who we should consider to share with us, and particularly on the value of scripture, we know Leslie has a deep love for the word of God because she has a great love for Jesus. She's a real mother uh, in her own church and a disciple of other women and somebody who has leadership in her own right, um, and, but stands and speaks. And so we're really thrilled that Leslie's gonna come and bring her value. So why don't you come up, Leslie? Let's welcome her. And uh, she's, she's married to quite a good man as well, Gareth. So we appreciate you for looking after Gareth for us because we, we love him as well and support him. Why don't we just stretch out our hands? Let's just pray. Father, we just want to thank you for Leslie. Lord, we thank you for the mother she is in God. We thank you for her care, her love, her years of faithfulness, her love for Jesus, her love for the word of God. And we pray... Lord, as we hear, as we listen, will we be stirred again to fall more in love with Jesus, more in love with the Word of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, I'd just like to really thank the UK team for entrusting this to me. Um, I count it a huge privilege. Um, so I want to take you to what the Regions Beyond website says about this value that we hold. And it says, we are committed to the faithful preaching and teaching of scripture as our first and final authority. And we can do that, can't we? We can take a really bold stance on scriptures because we believe that everything contained in our Bibles is the inspired word of God. Paul wrote to Timothy, all scripture, that's all of it, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So we need it. In a world that's desperate for truth, and aren't they desperate for truth? We can be confident that we have the truth. We have the truth in scripture. God speaks to us through the Bible and there is no higher authority. Amen. I was recently in a, a Zoom meeting, a Regions Beyond Global Forum meeting, and Nico Kapoor, who leads the Victory Hill Church in Edinburgh, I don't think it's here, is he? But, um, he was reporting back on behalf of, I think they're called the Next Gen, Next Generation Leaders Forum. Um, so he was reporting back on their behalf and it's a group of young and upcoming leaders who've been gathered by Ali Scott, who is here. And I was thrilled when Nico reported back and he said one of their stated strategies under the heading of teaching was, we will not trade reverence for relevance, stating that they would not compromise on Bible teaching for cultural relevance. And he quoted the Apostle Paul's instruction to Timothy to stay in Ephesus so that he could command people not to teach false doctrines because they result in controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work based on faith in the truth. And so they're not going to compromise in any way. And the only way we can be sure that we don't get into controversial speculations or find ourselves trying to be culturally relevant is to hold fast to the Bible as our first and final authority. We <coughs> preach it, we teach it faithfully, we're not going to be compromised on it, and this is what we in Regions Beyond Churches are committed to doing. Um, but this is nothing new. So in the 16th century, there were great influences, and they were instrumental in bringing about reformation in the church. And they had a phrase that guided all of their actions. And their phrase was, and here's a bit of Latin for you, sola scriptura, which meant that the final authority in all matters of belief and conduct is found in scripture alone. Didn't mean they were only gonna read scripture, it meant that all um, matters of belief and conduct is found in scripture alone. 
So they began to question beliefs and practices that weren't biblical. Practices that had been initiated by church leaders. They wanted the scriptures to be readily available for everyone to read and understand. I'm sure you've heard of the name William Tyndale. He was a gifted linguist. He could read ancient Hebrew and Greek, amongst many other languages. He discovered the good news of justification by faith, that wonderful scripture that John Cleveley read to us this morning. He discovered that when he read Erasmus' Greek edition of the New Testament. And he was so kind of fired up with this message that he wanted to share it with his countrymen. And he wanted to put an English version of the New Testament into people's hands. And he was engaged in conversation with a fellow priest concerning the need for the scriptures to be in the English language. And at that time, remarkably, because of laws enacted in the previous century, it was not permissible to own a copy of the Bible in English. That's in England. It wasn't permissible to own a copy of the Bible in English. Tyndale's companion priest was not convinced of the need for the scriptures to be translated. He is reported to have said that since people had the Bishop of Rome's laws, the scriptures were not needed. And to this, Tyndale replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, I will make a boy that driveth the plough know more of the scriptures than thou dost. Tyndale didn't only speak of the ploughboy having the scripture in a familiar language, but he also said he wanted to make him know more of the scripture than one who had been educated for the priesthood in the church. Today we have English Bibles so readily available we carry them in our pockets on our phones in multiple translations but I wonder would Tyndale be pleased today if he could see how available the Bible is to everyone or would he despair because availability hasn't increased real knowledge of the scriptures but the indifference towards the Bible is evident in our society and I'm afraid to say even amongst some in our churches. You ask your house group, how are you doing with your Bible reading? And they look at the floor. There are many wonderful Christian books and people in our churches read a lot of them. It seems we're more likely to read Christian books than to read the Bible. But the Bible is the all-sufficient, life-giving book that we need the most. In it we find revelation of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit. We find all that we need for life. We find the final word on matters of belief and lifestyle and church practices. The psalmist declared... Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Oh my goodness, what a challenge. How many of us would say that? He also goes on to say, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Um, We recently have had a, a church weekend away and we had light as our theme for that weekend. And this was one of the verses that we looked at. So we unpacked it and um, and we just saw the whole thing that what the psalmist is saying here is your word is a lamp. And it's like, imagine he would have had like a clay oil lamp. And and when you're walking in the dark, he would have used that lamp so that he could see where every step he was putting his feet. And he needed to see the path, didn't want to stray from the path. So he needed that lamp for every step of his life to to see the way ahead. But that's when you're looking down at your feet, isn't it? You need to see where you're putting every foot. But 
he also said, no, this is a light to my path. And, and that's not an oil lamp anymore. That's like the light of day as it just as a new day dawns. It's, it's the sun coming up. It's that kind of light. And that lights up the whole path. You know, and the, the scriptures, they give us the whole picture, don't they? It's a much bigger view. It's like you raise your eyes, you see the whole thing. It's from the beginning when God said, let there be light, right through to the end when Jesus is going to come. Again, this lights up the whole path. So it's useful for us for our everyday step by step life. We need to see. We've got to stay on this path, and this keeps us on it. But we also need to see no, there's a much bigger picture. This isn't all about me and my walk with Jesus. This is about God's plan for eternity, and it's all here, and we need it. Um, so we need to make sure that we're using the Bible as our lamp and as our light. We must make sure that the Bible is the central focus of preaching and teaching in our church gatherings. We must make sure that our church practices are derived from scripture and not from the traditions of men. We must make sure that we teach and model lifestyles where biblical principles are worked out in marriage, in family, and in working life. And I think and I hope that we're doing all this. But I wonder if we could take this even further. Tyndale wanted the ploughboy to know the scriptures. The wording of our regions beyond value is we are committed to the faithful preaching and teaching of scripture. Well, I'm not a preacher so I'm not qualified to speak to a room full of preachers about how they should preach. But I am incredibly grateful to you all who work very hard at exercising your preaching gift and faithfully proclaiming the word of God in our church meetings on Sunday mornings, on our, in our gatherings. I thank God for you all. But I am, and I have been in my professional career, a teacher. And one thing I know about teaching is this. Effective teaching has only happened if learning has taken place. Learning is the evidence of teaching. Numerous times over the years, I've heard preachers encourage people to read their Bibles, and rightly so. But how many of us have set out on Bible reading plans with the best of intentions to succeed, only to find, and it's not far in, is it, that we've fallen behind. We're not doing so well with it, and very soon we've given up. If we want people in our churches to develop a regular Bible reading habit and learn to feed themselves from this, you know, we don't want just spoon feeding. People, we want people feeding themselves from this. How are we going to do more to help them do that? An English teacher doesn't just tell her GCSE class to go and read Othello. She gives her students background. She provides them with learning strategies. She advises them on study guides. She brings the text to life for them by being animated about it herself. She wants them to love it and understand it and know it. She gets them to memorize portions of it. Her motivation is so that they can pass an exam well. The proof of her ability as a teacher is that her students learn and succeed. The goal of our teaching of scripture is so much more important than passing a GCSE exam. There's eternal value to be gained. Are we teaching people to read the text, consider the context, make connections, ask questions, check out the vocabulary, understand the meaning, and apply biblical principles to everyday life? The evidence that we're teaching these things will be that they're learning them and they'll succeed. 
We want to be there for each other's success. Many people in our churches seem to rely on their feelings and emotions, believing that the Holy Spirit will be their guide. They don't really see the need to engage with the Bible beyond listening to a sermon in church on Sundays. But what was the example that Jesus set? Jesus valued the scriptures. When he was doing his ministry on earth, do you know how many times Jesus referred to the scriptures? 78 times. He quoted from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, Micah, and Malachi. Jesus knew the importance of knowing the scriptures. They're vital to our growth as Christians. John Piper, that great American Bible teacher, says this, I have never met a mature, fruitful, strong, spiritually discerning Christian who is not full of scripture, devoted to regular meditation on scripture, and given to storing it in the heart through Bible memorization. And that's not a coincidence. The scriptures are powerful. They do things. Jesus said to Jewish believers, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Wow! If you get to know the truth, the truth sets you free. People can be bound up by many things, but freedom comes as we know the truth, and we find the truth in the scriptures. Perhaps this was more like what Tyndale had in mind. Not just reading the truth, but knowing the truth. He wanted the ploughboy to know it. And once the ploughboy knows it, the ploughboy's got this liberty, this freedom. Another one, Jesus prayed to his father, his disciples, saying, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The word of God sanctifies us. It helps us to become increasingly holy and sets us apart for service to God. We've already looked at the verse in 2 Timothy that tells us that scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I don't know about you, I need all those things. If we want to become competent and equipped for every good work, then we need the scriptures. Isaiah tells us that the word that goes out from God's mouth will accomplish what he sends it out to do. It will not return to him empty, but will succeed in the thing for which he sent it. So, the power to set free, the power to sanctify, the means of being equipped for every good work, and the power to accomplish God's desires for us is in the word. It's not in our efforts to change ourselves or others. The word will do the work. But without the word, our growth will be stunted. If the word of God is this powerful, this effective, this important, then surely we all need to know the truth in our minds. Know it in our minds and treasure it up in our hearts. We had a lovely prophetic word a few months ago, didn't we? And a lovely lady called Ali in our church. She said, I'm going through a really, really tough time. I'm feeling very low. But I've got some treasure in my heart. I know where to go when I'm really low. I've got treasure in my heart. Because she'd stored it there. We need it. As leaders, I think our responsibility is to make the word as accessible as we can to everyone. Who was Tyndale's ploughboy? He was not a man in training for the ministry. He was an ordinary, young uneducated, regular guy working hard at his everyday work and Tyndale wanted him to know the scriptures. 
I loved what Dan said yesterday about uh, being intentional about diversity, and I think that includes people of different intellectual capacity as well. I loved what Joy said yesterday about being there for one another's success. That means people of all intellectual capacities. We want to see them succeed. I want to see the ploughboy know the scriptures just as much as the one who's being trained for the ministry. So how are we going to do this? I think, first of all, we've got to treasure it ourselves. We should be those who love and treasure the word of God. We should model our love of the scriptures to others. People need to see Bibles in the hands of preachers. And I love it when a, Bible, when a preacher has a Bible in a book form. I, I, you know, yes, it's on the phone, but hey, you can't underline it on your phone. And, you know, it, it, I, I like to see the book Bibles. I was a bit shocked when Fuzzy said, I'm not actually going to read it. I thought, what? You're a Christian, you want the Bible? <laughs> So I think people need to see that Bibles in the hands of preachers, Bibles being read at prayer meetings, Bibles being used by those with prophetic gifts. But we also need to be practicing this ourselves in the secret place at home with the door closed when we spend time in God's presence, not just when we're preparing to teach or preach. We can't expect others to do what we don't do ourselves. We need to make sure that God's word really is our delight, our lamp, our light. Model a love of scriptures. You can even start with children. I used to love it when I was, in, when I was doing Sunday school work. We would invest in Bibles. We'd give Bibles. As soon as a child was reading, we'd give them a Bible, a children's Bible. I've done some pictures there of good ones. Um, so that we can show them well, this is a Bible, it's made up of 66 books, and they're all together in this one binding. And uh, we can show them how the books relate to each other. And, and we can demonstrate how to look up Bible references with them. We can let them follow the text as we read the accounts of these great Bible heroes. So they, they know this is different to other stories they hear. This is God's word. We can put youth Bibles in the hands of our teenagers and make Bible reading cool. <laughs> we can! <laughs> we can have adult Bibles available for people to borrow or give them away, just let them keep them. We can display Bible verses in our churches in creative ways. Let's model our love of the Bible in our churches. And then we've got to teach it. Paul gave Timothy this instruction do your best. To present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The word of God needs careful handling. Try to help everyone to engage with the word through passionate teaching. Make the Bible accessible to all by offering helpful tips and strategies that work. <coughs> Some learners really value visual aids, so think creatively about how to communicate Bible truths with everyone effectively. On our church weekend away, we decided that we would not have the children's work and then, we didn't even like calling it children's work, do we? Children's ministry and, um, and adults. So we thought, no, we're all going to be in together. So. When we did our teaching sessions, we, we just made sure it was kind of geared so that everyone could access it. And, um, and it was very visual. So we had a path on the wall and we had lights and we had all sorts of different things just to kind of make it very visual. Um, at the end of the weekend away, one of the adults came up to me and he said, on a Sunday morning, I, I, I don't take a lot, I'm a manual worker, I don't get a lot. From preaching on a Sunday, but I've got that. You know, I don't think we need to be afraid of just lowering the level a bit. We, we called it Sunday School for Grown Ups, and it worked. You know, it, it connected with him as a manual worker. I got that. 
Um, last week we were in a, a meeting in Orpington and, um, and Chris Smith was talking about the, the London Bible School that he, he does and runs with Daniel, I think, and others as well, Ali maybe. Um, and and Fuzzy called him out and he said, how many have you got faith for? And he said, 30. And Fuzzy said, that's exactly the number that I was thinking that the gods placed in my heart, 30. How about... So, that, so then what Fuzzy did, is he, he, he went round to every church leader there and he said, what have you got faith for? What have you got faith for? And, so there, and it was kind of tossing it up, you know, how many have you got? Four here, three here, five there. I wonder maybe, could we send a ploughboy to Bible school? You know, maybe he couldn't write the essays. But you take somebody with simple childlike faith and you give them some Bible knowledge and they've got all they need. Maybe they would be one of the weak and foolish things of this world. That, you know, brings such wisdom to those who just need to hear it. As effective teaching happens, we can confidently expect to see the evidence of learning taking place. The scriptures will do their work of releasing captives, sanctifying disciples, correcting error, training in righteousness, and equipping people to do the good works that God's prepared for them to do. Encourage your competent teachers to train disciples and rightly handle the word of God so that they're training others to rightly handle the word of God too. Gather those who bring prophetic insights and help them to sharpen their gift with sound biblical knowledge. If we're going to weigh prophetic words, well, we need to know, do they line up with biblical revelations about God and his will? We need to teach worship leaders to use Bible verses to call people into worship and to consider the songs they choose, making sure that the lyrics are aligned with scripture, not just the latest popular song release. <coughs> Otherwise, people, we, might, we might find that people get their theology from the songs that we sing in church, rather than from the word of God, and that's not a good thing. The Bible should be the plumb line for everything that we do in our churches. We're all aware that Bible study is a spiritual discipline and that we're in a spiritual battle. We have an enemy who wants to keep us from our Bibles and he's been too successful at doing it in the past. No discipline's pleasant, but it can be wonderfully beneficial. I wonder if we've been so wary of being legalistic about Bible teaching that we've become too lax about it to our detriment. I hope we can share Tyndale's passion for every ordinary, regular guy, ploughboy, to know the scriptures, to see his vision fulfilled for everyone in our churches. We say we are committed to the faithful preaching and teaching of scripture as our first and final authority. Let's renew our commitment to see this value wonderfully in evidence in every regions beyond church. Amen. Amen.